luckiest conference so far because it is now our 13th. Two days are going to be devoted to the continuing aftershocks of the BEPS global earthquake, namely the substance conundrum and the question of consensus on the taxation of the ever-elusive digital economy. To tell you more about this, I will leave the floor to Mr. Rajat Ramal, Chairman of IFA Mauritius. He's the Deputy Solicitor General to the Republic of Mauritius, holding a specialist LLM in taxation from Queen Mary University in London. He has been mentored by famous English lawyers such as James Guthrie QC and our very own Philip Baker QC. He's a member of the General Council of IFA, Netherlands. He's a fellow of the Honourable Society of Advanced Legal Studies in London and a member of the Hague Foundation for Tax Policy Research in the Netherlands. As senior barrister, Mr. Ramlal acts regularly for the Mauritius Revenue Authority. Mr. Lal is in good hands. And both before the Supreme Court of Mauritius and before the Privy Council in the UK. He regularly advises the government on legal aspects of financial matters and the, on the negotiation of tra tax treaties. He writes in international tax journals and, as you will see later on, he is on the editorial board of Global Taxation, a specialist tax journal. Recently re-elected as chairman of our association by a unanimous vote, he devotes a lot of his precious time to IFA Mauritius. Dear delegates, Mr. Rajesh Ramlal, senior counsel, the conference chairman for the welcome address. It gives me an immense pleasure as president of IFA Mauritius and conference chairman to address you on the opening of the 13th IFA Mauritius conference. The two themes of the conference are BEPS Action 1 and BEPS Action 5, BEPS standing for Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, and 1 is the chapter on the digital economy, and 5 is the issue of substance. This conference has been named the classic meeting in the IFA's recent World Newsletter, and rightly so. On the IFA route of yearly conferences, the Mauritius conferences to be held today and tomorrow has over the years established itself as the largest technical tax conference of IFA, not only in Mauritius, but in the African region. And we from the Mauritius branch are all proud of this achievement. The Mauritius branch has nearly 100 members and internationally IFA has a membership of 13,000 tax lawyers, accountants and academics. The holding of conferences and congresses is not the only activity of IFA. Although I must say that its congresses are gigantic, with usually more than 1,500 delegates, and the largest one, as far as I recall, is the one held in Paris in 2011 with over 1,700 participants. IFA Scientific World work is well known by the tax community through the Cahier de Droit International Fiscal, published once a year and distributed free to all members of the association, the yearly publication has been IFA's masterpiece since 1938. The publications contain a wealth of knowledge on international tax issues dealing with subjects to be discussed at the following Congress. Thus, for the 2019 London Congress, that is autumn next, Mauritius has participated in the scientific work by sending a comprehensive report on the taxation of investment funds, which is one of the subjects of the London 2019 Congress. And here, I must thank my technical team, composed of Ms. Mrs. Joanne Hay, Head of Tax Practice at Jewish Council Chambers, and uh, Mrs. Lina doman brett Senior Manager at the Financial Services Commission, both very active members of IFA, and for having researched and prepared the Mauritius report. The general reporter for that topic at the Congress is Dr. Octavia Redman, and is one, she is one of our speakers tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, from a collaborative standpoint, IFA has a consultative status with the ECOSOC. In that capacity, it is represented at meetings of the UN Committee of Experts on International Tax Matters. IFA also maintains close contact with the fiscal activities of the 
European Union, the OECD, and obviously the RBFD, its sister organization, uh, the representative of which I've mentioned, Balama, uh, is here, director of the Knowledge Center. An illustration of IFA's unique role in the world of taxation, where the public and private sectors are natural opponents, well, uh, this is in the nature of things, um, is in fact the meeting of all these experts at the Congresses, um, for example, at the joint IFA OECD meeting, and likewise recently we have a joint IFA EU seminar. So you will hear more about this in the short video um, addressed by our worldwide president, Dr. Murray Clayson. One of the important organs of IFA is its permanent scientific committee. It is currently headed by Professor Dr. Robert Gidano, who is in our midst this morning. And thank you, Robert, for uh, having accepted the invitation. And I'm thankful to you for your guidance in preparing the themes for this conference. Professor Adano will give a, pre a presentation on where we are, where we have reached on BEPS 1. He will also chair a world-class panel on the subject later this morning. I say world-class because of the presence of Luis Perez Navarro from the OECD and Professor Michael Kobetsky from the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, now imagine doing business through the internet. Not difficult, because many of you already do it. But to book, a, to book a taxi service, such as Uber, well, not, not here in Mauritius, Airbnb, um, Amazon, such business facilities operate on what we call platforms. Now, the question is, when you do that, where do you pay the tax? Or do you pay at all? Where to tax? Where do you have the consumer in this case? Or do you look for the server? Or is it somewhere in the cloud? How do you tax such transactions? And what to tax? So what is the tax base? A recent European Court of Justice judgment ruled that Uber is transportation service and not internet service. So back to basics. But what constitutes the taxable base? This is one of the issues we will grapple with over the next two days. One of the themes of the conference does in fact deal with the digital economy that's one would consensus be reached. Why? Because this is the multi-million dollar question for all international tax enthusiasts. Can consensus be reached when countries are going their own ways to tax the digital space? Dr. Tyson calls it the scattergun approach to unilateral national measures. Taking the digital tax in the digital space is a challenge. India introduced in 2016 what is called the Equalization Levy. India led the way on this front in the world. It is a tax of 6% on online advertising. In 2018, in the autumn budget, the UK announced a consultation on the introduction of a revenue-based digital tax in the UK. What is contemplated there is a 2% tax on certain digital revenues designed to capture elusive value um, created by user participation. The tax base in scope will be social media, search engines and online marketplaces. The UK government plans that the new tax will be applicable as from April 2020. So besides Brexit, the UK MPs have found time to discuss other things. Well, this tax will be called the DST, the Digital Service Tax. Many countries have amended the domestic or special based, um, such as digital or online presence, uh, to create what is called SCP, the Significant Economic Presence Test. But on a more global front, after the interim report released by the OECD earlier this year, the EU also proposed new rules for the taxation on digital business activities in the EU. The EU proposed two legislative proposals uh, for fairer taxation in the EU space. One, reform corporate tax rules so that profits are taxed where businesses have significant interaction with users through digital tax channels. Impose an interim tax that will cover seven, the main digital activities that currently escape altogether uh, the EU, EU uh, net. The OECD on its part released a policy paper in January this year, 2019, and is working hopefully towards a consensus-based solution by 2020. 
Hence the whole debate um, later today whether consensus will be reached. The UN has set up a committee to work on this, and we shall hear later, um, just after the coffee break, from Professor Michael Kubecki uh, on this matter. After lunch, we will be offered as dessert a digital plateau of crypto assets on the blockchain source. Well, last year I spoke to you about the dog, the computer, and a pilot in a, in a plane cockpit. Today I will refer to a ship called the Munich Mask. What is it? Well, it is a ship. It entered into service in June 2017. It is a testament to technological marriage of information and trans transportation. Its bridge looks like a very spacious cockpit, not like that of a plane. It is all driven by AI, artificial intelligence. Sailing with 214,000 tons from port to port, it has a crew of just 28. It is one of the best ships in the up-to-the-minute fleet of the big, from the biggest shipping company in the world, MERS. Now, the head of tax practice of MERS is with us today. Mr. Paul Baxter will tell you more about how to how MERS uses blockchain technology to make what is called the logistics last mile more efficient. Digitalization will not just transform how goods are moved around the world, but how the world will be transformed. We talk today about delivery drones. We talk today about driverless vans. In Estonia, grocery delivery is done by driverless carts today, and this is not fiction. The key to this transformation has now um, been made not just by new equipment in use, but how we handle data. And knowing where hundreds of millions of things are going and being able to act on that data. And uh, it's been said that data has, has, is now the new oil. How do we handle that? How do governments handle that? And this is yet another million dollar question uh, for, for um, our experts to look at. How do we tax the work that is done by robots? What is the future of work, it says. So ladies and gentlemen, the digital work is posing a number of challenges to the tax world. Um, and over the next two days, we will have the opportunity to address not only the taxation aspects of the Internet of Things, but more down-to-earth issues such as dispute resolution for tax matters. Do we go to the traditional court system, or do we go for arbitration? Um, a panel will be chaired by Professor Rick McDonnell, a former or ex-executive secretary of the FATF Financial Action Task Force, um, uh, later uh, today in, in the afternoon. Um, the other topic we will be on is POEM, the place, uh, the place of effective management. Um, this will be chaired by Professor Daniel Erasmus, who is now uh, almost a fixture here in Rio in this conference. So before ending, one of the topics I wish to flag out is a discussion in the sixth session tomorrow on private wealth management in family offices. Mauritius has been for the last 20 years known as a tax treaty jurisdiction. However, with the advent of BEP, MLI, and so on, we must adapt and gear up in terms of services, have better product offerings, and remain ahead of the curve. That session will be introduced tomorrow by Professor Dr. Philip Baker, QC, and um, why Mauritius should devote our servicing health network in Europe. So um, I welcome everyone and the speakers for the next two days. And uh, you will have the privilege of listening to no less than 42 speakers over 12 panels, including the Yin Moot, which is the Young EFA network. Uh, the, the topic is, is, a, is a very interesting one. It's, it's the treaty between Mauritius and Kenya and what is the future in relation to that. I will leave it to Professor Royal who had the our conference advisor uh, to thank um, our well wishes, including the, um, the, the sponsors. Um, organizing such a conference is a moving feat. I am thankful to my team. I wish the speakers well. Um, see you all um, in London at, at, uh, in the autumn. But for now, enjoy the wishes. Thank you very much. Dear Minister, dear Rayesh, dear colleagues, dear IFA members, for the warm introduction, and, and thank you very much to you for your remembering me that I was completing my PhD while I was working full-time at the firm. I'm sure that my wife is here with me in Mauritius, 
remembers as well uh, this, these moments. Uh, yes, so it's a pleasure to be here and, and then to address you um, and perhaps to give you uh, a little bit, I think that our President Mary Clayson uh, has highlighted what we are working on today uh, at IFA. Perhaps as Chairman of the Permanent Scientific Committee, I can also echo uh, these comments and perhaps highlight one of the several challenges that we're currently dealing with uh, with IFA. I think that as this event is showing, uh, IFA is gaining more and more uh, importance uh, in the global tax conversation, not only uh, in big countries, but also in small countries. The regional aspects of the IFA presence uh, makes it extremely important to the uh, global uh, tax conversation. I was uh, in India um, uh, last December uh, with Professor Rohagati for his um, conference, annual conference, which is now a signature uh, conference in India on international taxation. And I'm, of course, extremely happy to be here as a, as a follow-up uh, uh, to discuss many of these uh, issues which we picked up uh, in, uh, in India. And I guess that we will be discussing in India again uh, in December. Now, turning to uh, the agenda of this conference, which is perfectly in line which, uh, with what is going on currently at the international uh, level, I would say there are two main elements. The first element is that we only had a very, very, very short opportunity to digest the BEPS outcome, typically the transfer pricing outcome all the BEPS package that was released in October 2015. Remember, in this BEPS package, we were talking already about substance, about perhaps realigning value uh, with income, the concept of value creation emerge. We have tightened up transfer pricing rules with the objective of perhaps getting rid of artificial structures with no substance. And now, actually, we are with, as we are just digesting these changes, we are witnessing extremely important discussion in the area of digital economy, which, in fact, do not just concern the digital economy, but the entire economy. And perhaps it's even fair to say that this could lead to a reform of the international corporate uh, tax system, a reform that uh, as you have seen with the initiatives going on also in the European Union, but with uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 of the Digital Economy Initiative that we will be discussing um, uh, today, typically may involve a reconsideration of substance requirements about the relation between substance and tax rates. And all of these issues are much broader than uh, the digital economy. And I think that this conference is a wonderful opportunity to see where we are at this point. But at the same time, we will need another conference in the coming months and perhaps next year because the developments are just unfolding. Uh, developments are yet to come, but we're already starting to feel a bit what are the directions. And I would like, therefore, to congratulate the organizers of this conference for really picking the right topic at the very right time, bearing in mind that we're dealing with a moving target, and that was quite difficult. So congratulations, welcome to this conference, and on behalf of the Permanent Scientific Committee, thank you for organizing this conference. Thank you very much. First of all, my sincere apologies for being uh, late this morning. Uh, this was due to the, my driver underestimating the, the traffic jam. So, I will start with uh, the salutations. The Honorable Chief Justice, the Secretary for Foreign Affairs, the President of Alpha Mauritius, Board members of FSC, Excellencies and High Commissioners, Professor Robert Dunn, uh, Chairman of the uh, Permanent Scientific Committee, 
the committee of IFA Central, Chief Executive Officer of the FSC, um, Director General of the MRA, Mr. Lal, Professor Roy Wadgi, my two predecessors, Dr. Sitanen, who was from, uh, Minister of Finance and Economic Development, and I can see also Mr. Sushil Kushiram, who was former Minister of Financial Services, other eminent personalities, distinguished uh, speakers and guests, without forgetting Mr. Rajas from Lowe. Uh, he is the president of the IFA Mauritius. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. I'm extremely privileged and honored to be here again at Fima Flat a year on to open the IFA Mauritius Conference and address this eminent list lineup of tax experts and professionals from around the world. I wish to start with a few words of appreciation. Firstly, to Mr. Rajas Ramlal and his team at the Mauritius branch of the IFA for doing an excellent job. I wish to commend your committed efforts to further and promote the fiscal agenda, policies and strategies at national level so that we are recognized among the best in the league. I'm proud that despite your many engagements, you find time to devote to the IFA, to the IFA cause, and keep organizing the IFA, IFA's international event in Mauritius. Your message to your international counterparts is clear. By hosting this conference in Mauritius, we are saying to the international community that you are in the right place at the right time to discuss the future of tax governments. Allow me here to say a few words of welcome to our learned and distinguished delegates and speakers who have traveled from far to be here with us. I hope our good organizers have left some time on your schedule so that uh, you can enjoy our very unique attractions which beckon hundreds of thousands of travelers to our shores every year. And I wish to express appreciation to the OECD for its continued support and cooperation to our small island state, Mauritius. During the wake of the Second World War to rebuild Europe, the OECD has since then grown phenomenally in size, responsibility and outreach to help the world handle international challenges arising from globalization. The OECD has today become an incontestable stakeholder, value partner and a household name to governments and regulators, helping to shape a better world for all. So thank you, Mr. Perez, Mr. Perez Navarro, for taking time off your busy schedule to represent the OECD at this conference. The BEPS project, which we are here to talk about, has indeed made ex extraordinary progress in a short span of time. Its success, I believe, is its increasing approach rallying and winning over the allegiance of many states and emerging countries to this global tax governance undertaking. We are pleased that you are here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I just said that you could, you could not have found a more appropriate place and time to host this conference on BEPS Actions 1 and 5. Let me explain why. This government, ladies and gentlemen, fully conscious of its responsibilities, is taking every step to ensure that the effectiveness and readiness of the jurisdiction in guarding against diverse and often unpredictable risks and threats. In his 2018-2019 budget speech, the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Pravin Kumar Jagnath, has demonstrated the commitment of his government to further BEPS 
created bulk policies by announcing a string of decisive measures. On the home front, we see the action plan not only as an effective safety mechanism to respond to new challenges on the way, but also as a valuable structure to have in place to grasp opportunities ahead. We see the BEPS action plan when taken together as a sure means of addressing challenges and create opportunities for our international financial sector, financial services sector. So we have significant involved with a polyphony of action advocating the BEPS package. And 2019 is proving to be a year of delivery on the tax front. The BEPS action plan supports and strengthens the determination of the local tax authorities to bring evaders into the net and claim profit that is rightfully ours. The action plan is giving a boost to the taxman in his strenuous efforts to stop corporate profits from disappearing or artificially shifting to low or no tax jurisdictions. Such actions, ladies and gentlemen, undeniably result in greater confidence and trust for consumers and investors. At the end of the day, this is our goal, a better and fairer system which benefits our people. We can say that one of the most important outcomes of the BEPS project is a requirement that entities established in IFCs need to demonstrate a greater level of economic substance in the jurisdictions in which they are established in order to be able to continue to enjoy the benefits of low, low tax rates and protection under the double taxation treaties. Mauritius is fully really attuned to this BEPS principle that profits, profits should be taxed where substantive economic activities generating the profits of the firm and where value is created. And our system is gearing towards supporting substantive economic activities and a harmonization of the taxation regimes for domestic and global business companies. The landmark measures announced in the budget included the tax reforms in the global business sector. In response to BEPS Action 5, the deemed foreign tax credit regime available to Category 1 global business license companies was abolished on 31st December 2018 and a partial exemption regime introduced. <coughs> the category, category 2 global business license regime was abolished and the Income Tax Act provisions applicable to that regime reviewed accordingly. Effective as from 1st January 2019, a company holding a GBL license must at all times carry out its core income generating activities in or from Mauritius by employing directly or indirectly a reasonable number of suitably qualified person, persons to carry out the core activities and having a minimum level of expenditure proportionate to its level of activities. A company is tax resident in Mauritius if it is incorporated in Mauritius or has its central management and control in Mauritius. A company is considered as non-resident if its place of effective management is situated outside Mauritius. As we edge away from tax centricity to more substance, Action 5 presents us with a great opportunity to attract more international investors seeking to meet the new substance requirements to establish the, the base in Mauritius, thereby taking advantage of our quality workforce, well-developed infrastructure, and network of double taxation and bilateral investment protection treaties. In turn, our economy benefits by job creation and a more skilled workforce and wealth creation. Ladies and gentlemen, 2018 and 2019 are indeed years of delivery for us at the Ministry, the Financial Services Commission and the Mauritius Revenue Authority. The 
polyphenol action which we took and showed that we took the line in respect of the BEPS package and other international standards is yielding positive results. In November 2018, the OECD released the latest progress report from the inclusive framework on BEPS, which showed that Mauritius meets all the international requirements of the BEPS Action 5 and none of its local tax regimes have any harmful practices features. It reinforces the reputation of Mauritius as a leading international financial center and its ambition to double the contribution of the global business sector to GDP in 2030. We stood by our promise to address any remaining harmful tax features in our domestic tax framework when we signed the multilateral convention to implement tax treaty related measures to prevent base erosion and profit shifting at the OECE headquarters in Paris in July 2017. Later on, in March 2019, the European Union issued a press release updating the, its blacklist of non-cooperative jurisdictions in the continued effort to improve global tax practices and, tra and transparency. Mauritius has again proven its total commitment to upholding the highest possible standards of, sta of tax, good governance, and pro promoting itself as a staunch advocate of transparency and substance. The efforts made by Mauritius to improve its level of commitment towards the international movement to combat money laundering and illicit flows has also been lauded by international bodies, more recently by the Council of Ministers of the Assembly and FATF. We will leave no stone unturned to reinforce our legislative mechanisms and maintain our status of being a compliant, secure, and safe business and investment destination. So, ladies and gentlemen, you are here today and tomorrow to talk about the substance requirements conundrum. I would like to say here that if there exists at the beginning of at the beginning any conundrum in the application of the action plan, both for investors and IFCs, at the end of the day, the conundrum will give, give way to more sustainable living and investments for investors and ensure more sustainable development for IFCs. Ladies and gentlemen, I see from the program that you will also have you will also be speaking about BAPS Action 1 with regard to tax challenges in the digital economy and whether consensus would ever be reached. In an era characterized by digital revolutions, taxation of the digitalized economy is a burning topic on the global tax agenda. And how can we ever reach consensus on a subject that is taking the world by storm at every moment. The breadth and speed of change is defying all logic. We seem to be traveling a long journey in no time. Who ever thought we could transfer money from one remote village to another at the other end of the globe at a mouth peak? No borders whatsoever. We are today living on one township. We live in an open world. Technology knows no boundaries. As you seem to be grasping with one aspect of technological change by bringing legislative and regulatory action, by the time you implement the laws, it is overtaken by new advancements. Technological advances and digital connectivity are creating opportunities for global growth and prosperity. Many businesses are now transitioning online in a bid to streamline the management and day-to-day -day running of operations. This shift is being powered by a new wave of technology that allows companies of all shapes and sizes to be more strategic and efficient. 
This trend is set to continue as more businesses understand the benefits of digitalization and move to capitalize on them. The reliance on intangible assets and the massive use of data, for instance, pose challenges for international taxation. The greatest challenge is now is how to ensure that the right amount of tax is paid by the right person at the right place where economic value is created. Fundamental questions come to the fore, such as concepts of source and residence or the characterization of income for tax purposes. So conferences such as the one today helps in bringing experts on the same platform to exchange views and agree on concerted and covenant action and avoid double or other taxation. The only way, I would say, to come to grips with an increasingly digitalized global economy would be to harmonize international tax rules. However, digitalization has probably become one of the most important drivers of economic growth. This is undeniable. So it is crucial that any taxation policy should seek to promote or not hinder and not hinder economic growth and investment. Our policies should continue to spur business development, create jobs and kindle economic growth. I would wish here to share a few words from Prime Minister Narendra Modi's speech at a Digital India event, and I quote, In this digital age, we have an opportunity to transform lives of people in ways that was hard to imagine just a, just a couple of decades ago. This is what sets, uh, sets us apart from the century that we have just left behind. There may be still some who see the digital economy as a tool of the rich, educated, and the privileged. But ask the taxi driver or the corner vendor in India, what has, has he gained from, this set, from his cell phone? And the, and the debate gets settled. I see technology as a means to empower and as a tool that bridges the distance between hope and opportunity. Unquote. Prime Minister Bodhi went on to say, and I quote again, the task is huge, the challenges are many, but we also know that we will not reach the destination without taking new roads. Ladies and gentlemen, our government, our government has reached many initiatives showing that it is fully tuned to, di to digital mode for Mauritius to become even more digital and make the most of, its, of it despite these complexities and the cost of disruptions. We are committed through global initiatives and collaborative partnerships such, such as the IFA to address the challenges of a digital economy so that Mauritius can continue to be a great place at to work, play, and grow businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, the finance services sector falls within the remit of my ministerial portfolio, contributing 12% of the GDP, and it is growing at a rate of 5.5% annually. Our financial services sector is currently being revamped, and major amendments have been brought to the legal and regulatory framework. This paves the way to building its reputation as a jurisdiction of substance and as a springboard for the investors throughout the world. To this end, a blueprint has been mapped to define the strategy of Mauritius as an international financial center which will ensure compliance with the best international norms and standards established by the OECD. Ladies and gentlemen, your deliberations and input at such conferences are invaluable for us in policy development and implementation. Your expert inputs make our policies better so that we can better live up 
to have a duty to the nation as well as create the appropriate ecosystem to allow legitimate ambitions of businesses and individuals to blossom and flourish. Ladies and gentlemen, tax evasion and avoidance has become an international phenomenon. Such a global issue in an open world can only be tackled in togetherness. So I wish you all rich deliberations. I declare the 7th Asia Africa IFA Moses Conference open. I thank you all for your attention. As has been explained, the name has changed because there's nothing basic about the book anymore. Why IBFD, as far as this book is concerned? We only got involved, I think, in the last three or so years. Before that, the book had been published by another publisher. But when we started to speak with Roy in 2016, not only about this book, but about other initiatives that IBFD was doing in India, what quickly became apparent was that the mission of the Foundation for International Taxation, FIT, and the mission of IBFD were very similar. Both bodies are dedicated to the spread of international taxation to every corner of the globe. Both bodies are heavily invested in education for tax practitioners and for students as well. Both bodies are charitable enterprises, not for profits, and focus solely on the spread of everything to do with uh, international taxation, not only for publications, which we are talking about today, but also for conferences, uh, publications, teaching, and consultancy. And so we saw ourselves as a natural fit uh, for further collaboration. We started to collaborate in three main areas. The first is the FIT conference, which takes place every year in Mumbai. And we're very grateful that Roy invited us along to join as uh, co-directors of this a renowned conference. The second area we started to collaborate, and we'll see more fruits of that this year, is that we are grateful for the support of the FIT for the IBFD um, Advanced Masters in International Taxation, which we launched several years ago. It's now in its third year in Amsterdam, and we are really grateful for the support of the Foundation uh, in taking this program forward. And the third area in which we are collaborating and which we are talking about today is that IBFD graciously accepted to publish this book, uh, formerly known as Basic International Taxation, but now known as Royal Hadi on International Taxation. We didn't just come on board as a publisher, but rather we came on board as a co-author and editor along with Roy. We signed the contract in 2016, and one of the things that was key is that we need to keep the spirit of this book. This book was set up to teach people about international taxation at whatever level they enter into that discipline. And so that was paramount. We were not writing a book uh, with esoteric terms whereby the reader gets lost on the first page, but we wanted a book that would set out clearly the basic principles in accessible English and a book that will actually carry forward the intention uh, behind the author when he started it. And so we wanted to keep the voice of Professor Roy Hadley. And this is his clear voice, his authoritative voice, and his knowledgeable uh, impact on international taxation. The value that IBFD wanted to bring to this book was our incisive writing, the thorough research that we are known for as an organization, in-depth country analysis to enrich the book by looking at country practices across the globe, and in that sense, expand the focus from an India-focused book more to a global focus book. And finally, our high quality editorial operation, we brought all of this to bear, and the result of this is a book that showcases the best of IBFD and the best of the vision of Professor Royal Hadley when he set up this book uh, several years ago. So what I would do now is uh, to take a moment, express my great pleasure and privilege again uh, to be able to stand here on behalf of IBFD uh, to launch this book and to call upon Professor Rohadgi uh, to join me up here for the launching of the book. Thank you, by the way, the audience, and all that has been so far, said so far, and I've arrived to keep my presentation and comments to a minimum, because obviously most of it has been said. It has been a challenge, but here, let's see, what is really, really gratifying is that they have so far 
I think to do the book or my presentation, you understood why I started this conference and why I started the book. And somebody, in fact, at one of my presentations, I'm giving a lecture, said, Can you recommend the book? And I realized that they don't have a book. So therefore, I started writing one. And the first one took me a year to write. Because essentially, the presentation which I was giving, the news from that provided me 100 pages. And that all started, you wouldn't believe it, in South Africa, where I was in fact giving some lectures as a result of the professor there. But having said that, I found out that essentially, if you are going to really provide a book on comparative international tax, it has to be simplified. But anyone writes very any bad books, and there are books of them. Everyone wants to show how much they know about the subject. They don't look at the audience, they look at the other side and say, who is going to read it? You see, if you look at today's presentations and documentations, they are all written in various journals, etc., not meant for the layman who has to read it, but for the expert. Everyone wants to prove how much they know. So effectively, my job was to simplify. And it took me one year to write it, five years to simplify. And that I, in fact, in effectively the book, and, and, and one of the big, big, big challenges was essentially international tax effectively deals not with two taxpayers, but between the taxpayer and the revenue. And I mentioned that the revenue, which is the other side of the coin, that's where the picture is. I also bring the revenue into the picture. Nobody, in fact, essentially understands it. And I went to the Indian revenue. And I asked him, so they were, what do you do? They said, we hope it teaches us. So effectively what tends to happen really, a revenue person not having the experience, he doesn't take a decision, because if he doesn't take a decision, no one can blame him. But if he takes a decision that's wrong, then he loses his job. So effectively, therefore, there will be the people who are appeals or appeals, and what tends to happen in the Indian context, that the appeals last 30 years, for 25 years, and that for us people say, you don't work for the, your children, you work for your rich grandchildren. Because it takes you 25 years, in fact, I know of cases there, which in fact started in 1940, and they're still working on it. So the point I'm trying to get at here is, it has to be simplified, and put it in a format which in fact the main person can read. And that is not easy. Because everyone who I ask, can you provide me information about your country, is trying to prove how much they know, rather than the audience, which is, this is obviously different. Have you ever tried that? I mean, because you're in, I mean, this, this is a problem, I, I can understand the logic, because people who are young and want to write, they want to prove how much they read, write, how much they know about the subject, but we are not looking at it from audience point of view, who's going to read about it. I think this book has tried to, in fact, it help you these issues. And I'm so pleased today when I hear you all and say that you have actually understood that. Thank you very much. It has made me very happy. But that is the key really of this book. It has to be not only topical, it has to be updated because things change fast. Effectively, a book of that this nature, if it's six months old, it's already outdated in many years. You have to keep on keeping things to what everybody else is keep understanding it. And there are 192 countries or 195 countries today in the world. You have to understand the tax systems and how they interact. The treaties, in fact, effectively look at the interaction and try to resolve the issues. But effectively, you've got to go and look about the subject. Now, it's very difficult. I identified 75 countries in my list, and I get some indication. I then moved to 75 countries where I had contacts. I established contacts first before that. Uh, and they, in fact, I said, look, I only want five pages from you. So no way, you can't give you five pages. You can give you 75 pages. And then, in the end, I had to accept the 75 pages, and then write the understanding work, and reduce it to five pages. That's what took five years. So the point I'm trying to get at here is, thank you very much, you understood what I had achieved, and I will now go away very happy that I have achieved what I had tried to, 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 to uh, propagate. 
Uh, having said that, thank you very much for launching this book. Uh, and there is also, uh, and I open it. And uh, I think I, I have nothing to do with it anymore. I'm now a pastor, Ika, a writer. In fact, it's all in the hand of IBRD. We have very, very honest, uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, generously adopted this as a, a stepson or stepdaughter, whichever you prefer. And they are going to maintain it and run out of it. They have uh, obviously the facility, the, the capability. Uh, they have about a big group, about 40 people or 50 people who do research and keep updated data on countries practically around, all around the world. Am I correct? Okay, and they, that's what they do all the time. So I don't think I could have got a better group to step further this. Thank you very much. I step more than more like So thank you very much, uh, IBRP. Uh, I think this book would be of interest. Sorry? Okay, that's very good. I also, in fact, uh, would like to say a few words about the foundation. The foundation, in fact, was set up because essentially uh, we found that it had been started in, I think, uh, 25, uh, 23 years ago, 24 years ago. And because at that time, uh, I mean, no one knew me very much, so they said, okay, can you, can you, in fact, run a conference which was run by for the organization in Bombay called Bombay Management Association. And they called me and said, look, this is a, a, a topic which in fact no one knows, even the revenue don't understand it. So I started then giving presentations, prepared some notes. The book obviously provided me, not, the book wasn't ready at that time, this was probably in the 95, 95 is when I started. And I in fact worked with them for, for 10 years uh, and they would go all, and the first, it was very unnerving, but the first meeting they organized was in the, uh, the dining hall of the, of the best hotel in, in Bombay, called Taj Mahal Hotel. I think those who probably been there were more. And it was full of, of uh, financial controllers and of the financial directors. And they didn't understand anything, so I feel I could bring it down to their level. And, and then I suddenly found that there were many people coming in as well. And that there were a whole host of them who were giving lectures at different conferences. And that went on, and the roots of all that were all put together in this book. And the book was launched in 19, 2001 by no other than Klaus Wohl. I don't know how many of you know of Klaus Wohl. Klaus Wohl is a legend, and I think his book is still used probably the most uh, renowned book on international tax uh, of the early 90s. And it's still, it's in third edition, for his, his, his passed away in 2007, but his book in fact is still used quite extensively by revenue officers, by judges, by anyone who wants to understand about international tax globally. In India, again, it's used, this book is used quite extensively uh, you go to any revenue office and you'll find they have copies of this because they were nothing else. And I think it's interesting that when I started FIT, the, the branch here, uh, it's, I would like to thank our friend there, uh, the minister sitting behind you. And, you, and, you, and he's the one who got me involved. I got a letter, for, uh, an email from him at the time in London. He said, can you come and see me? So I did come. And he said, look, we want to do something about training our people in international tax. Am I correct, sir? And uh, I initially sent out an email. So I said, OK, uh, we have to find a university. And I looked around the world, and I think I got one reply, which is from Western Australia University, uh, somewhere, somewhere around there. But they wanted to charge $200,000 for it every year. But that was a no road to begin with. And that's when I think they found that the book can come handy. And that was very useful. I said, I need 20 people. Because if I want to set up a Nifa branch, to set up a Nifa branch, they must have 10, 20 people sign up. And if you don't have 20, the, 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 the committee doesn't, in fact, accept your application. So I am in 
you see it right? Somewhere? Okay, we don't have to have the the sponsoring the, we were effectively, the, but sponsoring the, the application is from Vienna. And the, uh, that year. So effectively, uh, we, we, we got a class, we got, I got to all these 20 to sign. And they knew nothing about the subject, but I said, you just sign and give it to me, that will go. And that was the start of EFI in, 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 the, in, in Mauritius. And I'm so delighted to see today, it's come full circle in 30 years. It is remarkable, and I would like to congratulate all of you for the fantastic job you've done, particularly our good friend here, uh, <coughs> who is the chairman of the conference, uh, Rajesh Ramla. I mean, he's worked very hard on it. It's been, it's been a, a, an average, and I've been delighted to be able to cooperate with him. And I think now I'm trying to take it easy, so I think best needed now, but I'll be obviously available if he needs help. Having said that, what, is, what makes me very happy about this conference? This is the first time I have heard the word substance in such great detail. It's funny, in fact, in the 1990s, 90s, in fact, uh, I was in London, and one of the speakers, in fact, we have for tomorrow is effectively, uh, what's his name, from a uh, uh, he, he's, he's in fact not here, but he is giving a presentation to the internet, etc. Uh, a little bit, or oh, is it a live presentation? Philip Baker. So Philip Baker is a old friend, and he and he one day asked me, so why do we have to have a, a, the UN moment? Because we have the UN moment. And that was the start of the idea of why do we have the UN moment? This was in the late 80s. So I went to the idea of the library, which is the finest library of international tax in the world. I have, and I spent, I must have spent hours in that to do research for this book. And they would provide me with tons of material. And they have all the, the minutes of all the meetings of the League of Nations from 1920, when in fact they were asked to look at this issue after the First World War, of having a tax treaty. And the first model tax treaty was to 1938, if I like to write me, there were three, three versions of it, and none of them were accepted. But the point is, is in fact, really is that they were, in fact, effectively developed countries, or that they were, the, the, if you like, the big first of the Second World, first World War. And that was continuing on under the League of Nations, and effectively found that, that there were two branches. There were the developed countries and the developing countries. The developed countries, in fact, United, America joined in 1935, and the developed, the developed countries, in fact, had their version, the Americans had their own version, and the developing countries at that time were the effectively South Americans. It's interesting if you don't think about it, but they were South Americans, particularly countries like Brazil, Venezuela, and, and, and countries around there. Because and they were apparently very actively, because obviously they were big, big sort of exporters, of food particularly, and even today they are. So effective, and they, they suddenly found that, that the, all, the, all the money was going to the developed countries. Who said that we provide the money, we provide the capital, we provide the resources, we in fact therefore should have all the, 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 the high, large share, we will give you cost plus 5%, and that is all, and we give you so much, the technology and capital has all come from us. Now that was what in fact led to an issue, and in fact it's interesting that the, 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 the London model, which came in 1928, was superseded by the Mexico model in 1942. And the, there the, the, the developed countries lost out, Developing countries, and they argued that that was because of the war. So therefore, sorry? Okay, that's good. But I'll just take about the five more minutes. So I'm trying to get out of the way that 1945, that was another position. And the League of Nations, they, the developed countries got rid of the League of Nations. 
And the only city was born in 1955. In 1955, and that is what we have still made. But what has happened now, the reverse, the developing countries, are the developed countries are becoming developing countries today. And the developed countries, the developing countries are becoming developed countries. I mean, China and even India, India has the sixth largest economy in the world today. Which people don't think about very much, but that's a fact of life. And it's growing at that rate. But the fact that they're not trying to get it, substance has become important. And the substance, effectively, is, is, is key. Well, I'm uh, glad we have substance, and, uh, and whereas the, the developed, the, 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 the OECD model was FAR, but, uh, uh, sort of, uh, which is, uh, uh, which in fact, uh, they have now added an M, which is, uh, which is in fact uh, market. And market, because if you don't have a market, effectively, there is nobody to sell, and you have no price. I believe the FAR definition is a separate the book, which has been advised by it to keep it short. But I think farm owners that M is now become important. I made that point at the UN meeting about 10 years ago, and I have a boom. Today it's interesting to see that it's not part of reality. With those few remarks, thank you very much for, uh, for in fact, making a few comments, and I'm, I'm very delighted. I'd like to now just take the, the opportunity to thank all the speakers, but that's one by room. Uh, and it's been, I, I'm glad I will not go into details, but I think all of them have done a splendid job. I would suggest to the advisor, the, the, the organizers, that they should in fact publish, in fact, a, 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 again, a, a special issue. The foundation last year, in fact, uh, courtesy, uh, as the conference director here, Rajesh Ramlan, who is the chair, who is the editor of this, has published, in fact, some of the key sort of uh, presentations of the conference last year in Bombay. There are copies of this, and I think we've got enough copies to distribute to all of you. And I think, have a look at it, with, that they have been well written. The idea really is to spread the knowledge as much as possible. So thank you very much for your time, and thank you to all of you who have, in fact, made a conference a, a success, particularly our chief guest, in fact, the uh, minister. I must say I'm very impressed by a bad idea. I mean, you've done everything I wish I had done. So, like, for example, you've been working for one of the top firms in the world. Am I correct? You are the chief professional accountant. Okay? Uh, I have a bad idea. And, you can buy, and the father of two children, I can't, I can't claim we don't have any kids. But otherwise, in all other respects, I, this is somebody I would I look forward for you all to emulate. Okay, and it is the, he in fact has been a, a great supporter of the other healthy idea of the IFA here in Mauritius. And we hope that he will continue. I think, uh, uh, thank you, Belinda, for launching the book. And thank you very much. Uh, 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 so, um, Robert, for your kind words, Robert has also been a great help in Bombay, and so has Oscar, uh, the, uh, Rajesh as well. So we look forward to seeing you in Bombay if you're interested. The dates this year are 26th, 7th of December. It's always the first Thursday, Friday, Sunday. And we normally have about four to 500 people for the 7th star hotel. So the first of a few months, thank you very much.